Well, good evening. As Jill said, my name is Darcy Suwilla, and I currently volunteer with the Balmer Bridge to Hope organization, where we work with women who've been sexually trafficked, and um, most of them are free now. But I started my journey working with trafficked victims in Niger, West Africa. And when I was there, I would go visit the compounds. And by compounds, I mean there was a courtyard with rooms around it where these women would work, um, where they were forced to work. And so I would go visit these compounds, and sometimes my heart would just break. I would see a woman who was physically marred or psychologically broken from beatings from her captors. Or I'd walk past a door, and I would know someone was locked in there, but I was powerless to help. Let me ask you a question. What would you do if you knew that someone was locked behind a door and trying to escape? What if you knew that they were freshly taken and that they were being broken by their captors? Would you call the police? What if the police were already on that compound using some of the women? What would you do then? The fact is there are no simple solutions or answers when you're working in all situations of human trafficking. And one would also think that a victim would just jump at the opportunity to, to leave if they were given a safe way out. But they're often just caught in a cycle of abuse and they genuinely fear retaliation for themselves and their families. One victim told me that she once escaped, but where she, could she go? She knew nobody and she was in a country that she didn't even know the language. So after a few days, her captors um, captured her again and forced her back into sexual slavery. But she thought, well, at least I'm, I'm here, but my family is safe back in Nigeria. But were they? A few days later, she got a phone call, and it was from her brother. Her captors forced her to listen. Just imagine, they forced her to listen while her brother was tortured and killed. And she knew the whole while that it was because she had just tried to escape. These are the tactics that keep women in fear and unable to leave. But in spite of this, many women do leave. And they all have an individual story on how they are able to break free from their captors. But the important thing to remember is once victims leave, they do not immediately become survivors. In fact, their identity as a victim is often intensified. They are left marginalized, helpless, without any legalization or representation in a foreign country. Their traffickers have taken everything. They have no papers, they have no passports, and no money. And these women are at a high risk of being re-trafficked. So that is one difficulty that I see working in the field, is how to keep these women to stay out of being re-trafficked again. Um, and from working with the Balmer Bridge to Hope project, one thing that I've come to realize is that it takes um, organizations that are there for the long term. It also takes organizations that are willing to work on the whole of the individual. These taking, um, building trust takes a lot of time. And there are no quick fix solutions when working with victims of human trafficking. These individuals do not trust anybody. They do not trust the authorities. They do not trust the government. And they do not even trust the organizations that are trying to help them. Building trust takes time. And it needs organizations that are there for the long term. And I also believe that there needs to be a whole person approach that helps them in the long term. And this includes looking at their physical, their social, their intellectual, their emotional and their spiritual needs. All of these things need to be worked on together in order to help these victims become survivors. And I can only briefly talk about three tonight. So I'm going to um, talk about their physical needs, social needs, and educational needs, just hitting a few points. Often when women are recently freed from trafficking, their physical needs are immediate. They need a safe shelter, and they need food to eat. Just having these two items can often mitigate the risk they, that they are re-trafficked again. At Belmer Bridge to Hope, we provide our participants a nutritious breakfast and lunch every time we meet. 
And in doing so, these women are able to not have to worry about being hungry that day or trying to find money to eat and to buy food. And each of you can help with their physical needs. And new, new things do not need to be invented to do so. Um, when I'm traveling, I often see the seven acts of mercy, and they're depicted on museum walls and beautiful paintings, and they're etched into ancient cathedral doors. All of us can feed the hungry, give a drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked. And if you can't do these things in person, you can always give resources or money to organizations that are. Another area that needs to be met for recently freed victims is their social needs. And this includes their legal requirements. One thing that I would have loved today is to have a survivor standing right here beside me telling her story to you, but I can't. These women have no legal representation, no legal status. They are living in fear that they are going to be caught, deported, and sent to jail. They often just live in the shadows of our society. Um, people, and all, people, and often, people often ask me, why don't we, these freed victims just want to go back home to their families? And that's a good question, but it's not as simple as that. Often there's a real threat for these individuals back home for them. Um, one victim who I know, she would love to go home to be with her family. However, she still owes her traffickers money. Her traffickers don't know where she is, but they do know where her family is. And they have already been to her family, harassing them, torturing them, demanding the repayment for her debt. How can this woman go back home? For her, she fears what is awaiting there. She fears being re-trafficked. And she'd rather live here in the shadows of a foreign country than risk what awaits her in her home, in her own home country. So systems need to be in place that help the former victims and their legal requirements do need to be met. If they do not have any legal status, then they are at a high risk of being re-trafficked. Government programs help a lot of individuals, but a pro the problem is they categorize. And a lot of victims can't be put into this category, and they fall through the cracks. There are individuals um, from all different situations, all different backgrounds. They've been through all different um, different stories and they can't they don't all fit the molds that are created and so they just fall through the cracks and they do live in the shadows of our society often in fear so there's organizations like the one i work for belmer bridge to hope that works with these individuals who have fallen through the governmental cracks and there also needs people who can help with their legal advice help them with the ins and outs so that they can navigate their way out of the shadows safely Another issue that I see is their intellectual needs. And this can be addressed by education. Many of the women who work in our, or come to our program do not have a high school education. Many of them were trafficked as early as the age of 14. So educating them, it, it can take several forms. It could be reading and writing. It can be vocational training. It can be language learning. There are so many different ways that these women want to learn and are able to learn. And educating them provides them with um, the resources that they need to make better decisions. It gives them the knowledge to be able to uh, mitigate the risks that they can see on their own. It, it gives them self-confidence. And this is an area that I see as so important and so amazing. Once these women start receiving an education, they see that they can do it they can make a better life from their, for themselves. There is hope for them. It really provides them hope. And education also um, gives them a, the hope that in the future, they will be able to have stable employment, that they will be able to have a job and make money for their own. And this type of education can't just be given by handouts or by short-term five-week courses. Those are definitely needed. To actually help people for the long run, there needs to be organizations and educational opportunities that are going to be there taking time with them, guiding them, taking their hand, and working with them um, in a relationship of some sort of trust. 
and each one of you can help with their intellectual needs. Why don't you volunteer some time with the different organizations? Legal advice, health and nutritional training, vocational training, creative writing, no matter what you, your specialty is, I can guarantee it can be used somehow. And if you can't volunteer time, you can always give resources. Things like computers um, and training manuals, training resources, these help women have something concrete that they can work towards. It gives them real skills that they can use in the world, and it helps them to just simply further their education and gain the self-confidence that they, they need to get out. And you can always give money to organizations that are currently working with victims of human trafficking so that they can get the organizational materials, educational materials that they need. Global, the global expanse of human trafficking is overwhelming when you look at it in its entirety. But there is hope. There is hope for women once they are free that they can stay out and not be re-trafficked. Re but it will take organizations that are there for the long term, and it will take programs that look at their whole of their person, their physical, their social, their intellectual, their emotional, and their spiritual needs. All of these are needed to work together in order for the woman to walk the road from victim to survivor. Thank you.